Good morning. Good to see you. We have, we have somebody who's pretty special with us. Uh, at least that's what his wife tells me. And uh, I'm excited to have him here. He's becoming a good friend of mine. Uh, we send our teens down to Amazing Grace Baptist Camp uh, pretty much every summer and winter now. Uh, we're getting into that momentum. Love the camp. Uh, love the spirit down there. And I'm looking forward to having the camp director with us. Uh, so, Brother Josh, if you'd come up and you can give yourself a little intro if you'd like as well. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Josh. Uh, this is my second time, I believe, I've been here. And that was a couple years ago. I can't recall if it was before COVID nonsense or after, but either way, I made it back. And it's good to be here. And uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Daniel for allowing me to come back and be with you. I have enjoyed my relationship with the church and I look forward to these young people coming out to camp every summer and winter. And, uh, you know, we don't exist apart from the churches. And so we're just happy to be able to serve you in any way we can. And we're happy to be with you here today. Uh, later for the morning service, I, I brought my guitar. Uh, pastor asked me to do some of my fun songs. So we'll have, we'll have a good time. And then uh, you have a fall festival tonight. Now that's pretty exciting. Are you going to dress up? <laughs> Some people are like, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, for Sunday school, let me take you to Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter number five. We're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount at one of Jesus' uh, famous uh, sermons. In fact, we're going to look at two sermons that Jesus preached while he was here on earth. In Sunday school, we'll look at the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll look at verses uh, starting with verse 13 down to verse 16. Let me read aloud and you follow along. Very familiar passage of scripture. It says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It, it is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then here's our concluding key verse. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this opening passage called the Sermon on the Mount starts with what's called the Beatitudes. So Jesus begins to preach what he has called to his disciples, but of course, there would have been multiple people present to hear Jesus preach because he's becoming very famous at this point of the chronology of his life on earth. And so many people came to the mountainside to hear him preach, but he opens up his famous sermon with telling people it is a blessing to be a Christian. And if, and if you're blessed to be a Christian, why don't you say amen to that? It is a joy to be saved, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so he begins to lay out, starting verse number three, the blessings of being a follower of Jesus and a disciple. He says, you know, blessed are you that are poor in spirit. You know, you have no spiritual resources on your own to merit and earn righteousness and earn favor with God. But yet, uh, because of the provisions of God, we are blessed even though we're poor, we have inherited the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a blessing. Um, if you're broken over your sin, if you're, if you're sick of this present world, hey, if you're mourning over that, God says you're blessed because you're going to be comforted by the grace of God. Now, uh, if you're hungry for God, you're thirsting for righteousness, God says he's going to feed you the, what you need for righteousness. Hey, we are blessed people. And so he then gets into verse 13 about the characteristic traits of what a follower of Jesus ought to look like. And this is what we ought to be. We should be salt and we should be light. And then he gets to verse uh, 16 and he says, you know, in light of what we just discussed, hey, you need to take what's been provided for you, these blessings, and you need to channel that out to other people. The lost world needs to see what's in you Something that's different. They need to see God. They need to see the work of God. They need to see that you really are a Christian. So I, I, I would title uh, uh, this lesson this morning, being a channel of blessing, being a channel of God's glory. 
You know, the Bible says in the New Testament, we're, we're like clay pots, earthen vessels. And yet in these earthen vessels, what we are, God could put his light inside of you and you could shine brightly. So let's talk about being a channel of blessing. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, just open up our understanding of what it means to, to channel the glory of God and help us to reach more people for Jesus Christ. We give you all the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Amen. Very good. Um, about a year ago, I had done some tests over in Lawrence at the hospital for uh, what, what I have as a heart problem. I, I have a, or I did, had a defective heart valve. Uh, the doctors discovered this with some tests about seven years ago. And this runs in my family, so it's not a surprise. But, uh, but when I went in uh, seven years ago, they said, well, let's do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound on your heart. And that's when they discovered I had a leak on my, my valve. And so they said, well, we need to monitor this before it gets any, any worse. And of course, I'm, I was a little familiar with this because my father, my uncle had had valve replacements already. Uh, my great-grandfather died at 52. My grandfather died at 51 from what they classified as heart attacks back in those days, but most likely it was from defective heart valves. That's what we assume now with the technology that we've discovered. And of course, with the family history, uh, the ugly genetic branch hit me as a child. And so I was born with this, but I never knew it. You know, uh, the widow maker heart problems never show up until you have a problem unless you see a doctor. So that's, that's why it is important to go get it checked out if you have a family history of heart issues. And so seven years ago, I went in for some elevated blood pressure and then they discovered this. Well, then four years ago, um, around the time that my daughter, my, my, my last child was being born, uh, they, I had just done an echo and they discovered I had an aneurysm growing just above the heart valve. And the doctor said, well, we need to watch this if it begins to, or if it continues to balloon, eventually you, you'll have to have surgery to replace it. There's no medication that repairs an aneurysm. You just have to have a procedure done. So, so your valve uh, should be 3.5 centimeters in diameter. That's how they measure that. And so if it gets to be bigger than five, then you have to have surgery. Maybe some of you have had this procedure done. So, so when they discovered the aneurysm, it was reading about a 3.6. And then the next year it went to four. The next year it went to four, six. Then it, then it went to four, eight. And then we had COVID and I didn't go get a checkup for 16 months. So I finally went in a year ago. And I remember that I had an aneurysm and I asked the technician, I said, hey, what are the numbers reading? Well, what's it say? And I watched the screen and it said 5.2. And then my emotional heart sank because I knew what that meant. Based off what the cardiologist told me before, if it gets to be above five, you're going to have to have surgery. So I asked the technician, I said, do I need to go check in the hospital? And they said, well, they'll meet with you at your follow-up appointment, which was a whole week from the test. So I was in limbo for a week thinking, am I going to have open heart surgery? I'm, I'm 36. So this was a year ago. I was 35. And I'm facing open heart surgery, and I couldn't even imagine that. I mean, I mean, look at me. I, I'm handsome. I mean, I, I look good, right? <laughs> One person enjoyed that joke, my wife. Um, I, I do eat uh, a healthy diet. I, uh, I exercise reg regularly. My job is a very active job. And so that's in the, that's in the forethought. Yeah, maybe when I'm in my 50s, 60s, or 70s, I'll have surgery, but not at 35. And then all of a sudden I'm being told the following week, you're going to have to have open heart surgery. This is serious. So on December the 13th of last year, I went in for, for sur surgery. Uh, I checked in at the hospital at 545 in the morning. That's AM. You know what AM stands for? Almost morning. So it's very early. So I went to the third floor of the Kansas Research Hospital, University of Kansas, in downtown Kansas City. I was in the, uh, they took me to the last room in the pre-op center. They checked me in, and the nurses, well, they, they get down to business in pre-op. You know, they're asking you lots of questions. They're putting needles in you. 
um, to take fluids from you and to put fluids in you. The anesthesiologist, in fact, the most painful experience was uh, the anesthesiologist came and he was trying to put the IV in my wrist so that they could put me to sleep. And for whatever reason, they couldn't get it in. And it just felt like this rod. They were trying to stuff up my arm. And, you know, they're trying to distract me with questions. I know the routine, but it still didn't work. It hurt. And then finally, they said, well, we'll just wait. We'll put some gas on you and wait till you fall asleep, and then we'll do it. I thought, you know, you could have done that to begin with. That would have helped. But whatever the reason was, that's, that, that was the most painful experience. And uh, they shaved me from the neck to the toes. And I've never had that experience before, but they said I had nice legs. So what do you know? And then, uh, and then the nurse practitioner comes in and she says, well, Mr. Burkholder, we need to discuss um, what it's going to be like with your new artificial valve. And I said, whoa, time out. I came to get an aneurysm repair. The doctor who I had met the you know, a couple weeks before, said that they would not, most likely not, have to replace the valve. It leaked, but it wasn't too severe at the moment. So she said, well, when they open you up, there's a good chance that you may, they, they, they would discover more information that the tests do not show. She said, so, so he's recommending that you get an artificial valve if that takes place. Now, mind you folks, my father and my uncle have had valve replacements and they all warned me, don't get the mechanical artificial valve, get the flesh valve. Because there's all kinds of problems that come with a fake valve. So, so this has been conditioned, preconditioned in my mindset. So if I was gonna have to make a decision, I knew what I was gonna do. So I looked at the nurse, I said, I'm sorry, uh, I understand what you're telling me, but I, I will choose a flesh valve. She says, well, the doctor in his notes have put down a, an artificial valve. And I said, well, uh, I understand, but I, I want a, a flesh valve. She says, well, he wants you to get an artificial. So I, I noticed that we're having a little tug of war here. I said, well, why don't you tell me then what is an artificial valve? Uh, how is it gonna function? What's it gonna be like? She said, well, you're gonna have to take a blood thinner for the rest of your life. She says, you're gonna have to watch your vitamin K intake because if your levels are thrown off, you might have a stroke. Um, she said, oh, and there's this ticking sound like a clock that will, uh, you're shaking your heads. Do, you, do, do, do one of you have that? You do. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I said, well, thank you, but that's, you're a horrible salesperson. I don't want that. I'll take a flesh valve, please. She says, well, I'll let you talk to the doctor. So Dr. Downey comes in and an incredible human being. And, uh, he says, well, Josh, he goes, I understand that you, you're deciding to, to go with a flesh valve. I said, yes, sir, I, I understand what she's telling me and I understand the statistics and all that, but, but I've made this decision before I came in here if I was gonna face this. And I don't really wanna make a last minute change before you will me in and open me up. That's not in my ethos to make a split second change in my decision. You know, God's gonna have to really reveal to me uh, clearly that, that that's what I need to do. He says, well, this is what you need to understand. If you choose to do the flesh valve, he says, there is a 10 year lifespan on those valves. He says, and you're a young man, you would probably wear that valve down faster. He says, I'm telling you in 10 years, we'll be right back here. I, I, I was overwhelmed. You know, what am I supposed to do with this new information? That's, that's pretty heavy stuff. I said, what, what, what am I supposed to do? And he says, well, you need to make a decision. And I said, well, can I pray about it? He said, sure. So right there, there were six people in the room and it got very quiet. And then I just called out to God. And it was pretty informal. I said, God, what are we doing here? I said, I need the spirit of wisdom. This is a tough decision and I don't know what to do. I need you to help me. I need you to show up right now. And I pray that you'll bless everybody in the room. I pray that you'll be with Dr. Downey. Help everything to be a success today. Let things go smoothly. And then I said, amen. And I'm telling you folks, it was as if a light bulb had just clicked. And I knew exactly what to do. 
So I looked at the doctor and I said, Dr. Downey, I did not choose this. God allowed this in my life. I said, I didn't even choose you. The insurance company has signed you to me. <laughs> I felt bold at that moment to say that. I said, but I believe God put you in my life. And I think he wants me to trust you. And so I trust you at this moment. If you have to give me a new valve, I'll take the artificial one. Now, folks, I don't know how to describe it, but it was a very precious, moving moment where I asked God to show up, and I'm telling you, he did. I, could, I couldn't see behind the masks that everybody was wearing, but I could see with their eyes just this glow as if God had stepped in the room and just touched everybody. Not, not because there's anything special with Josh Burkhold or there's nothing special with me. It was in my moment of weakness and my humanity. I needed God to show up and I'm telling you, he did. So I went in for surgery. When I woke up, I said, well, what happened? And they said, you had holes in your valve. We had to replace it. And so I said, well, then that's great. That's exactly what God wanted. And I've had no regrets from that moment. Because God gave me an opportunity to, to show to maybe lost people in the room that there's something that I lean upon that's bigger than me. I have a God that rules over the affairs of my life. And if he wants me to struggle with this trial, then I'm going to embrace that moment. I'm going to allow him to have his full work done in my life. And then maybe perhaps somebody that doesn't know Jesus would see my faith and go, wow, I don't know what's going on with that guy, but I need that. And, and, and then, it, then I realized that God could use me, he can use you to be channels of his blessing. As followers of Jesus Christ, there ought to be something different in us that the world can see and it can attract them to God because we are to be lights and we're to be salt in this world. So, so let's talk about being a channel of blessing. There's three points if you wanna write it down. If not, I'll just tell it to you. Number one, if you're going to be a channel of God's glory, you wanna be a blessing to people, then number one, you gotta be a virtuous Christian. A virtuous Christian. And that's with this metaphor or this symbol that we see is salt. That's the meaning of the salt. Salt was used in Jesus' day. It's used in our day in the similar fashion, but as a preservative. And it's also used to put flavor on food, the savory meats, if you will. And so Jesus says, hey, my followers, my disciples, the first description is that they are the salt of the earth. And you need to be a virtuous person. A virtuous person means to be morally excellent, chaste, potent and efficacious. So here's the first one. If you're gonna write down a sub point under virtuousness or being a virtuous Christian, write this. Being a virtuous person is being an impediment to the moral decline that's around us in society. Because salt is a preservative to preserve decay, to preserve, uh, preserve from fermentation. And that is a principle of sin in the Bible. Okay, so this fermentation process is what's taking place in this world today. It's what we call the second law of thermodynamics. This world is constantly disintegrating. It's decaying. It's getting worse and worse. And one day God's going to have to make a whole new earth for us to dwell in because the sin and the curse of the world is decaying constantly. But there's one thing that's in impeding. There's one block. There's one roadblock to this world becoming fully undone, going to hell in a handbasket. And the one thing is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is living within Christians because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And one day when Jesus comes back and he'll, we'll meet him in the clouds, then he will have removed the thing that's only allowing it that we know from the, uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians. And when he is removed, then this world will go what's called the tribulation. It's going to be so chaotic. You don't want to live on this earth at that time. So at this moment, Jesus has not yet returned. At this moment, the Holy Spirit's still doing a work in our lives here on earth. And you are the one thing that's impeding the full decay of this world. And it's being a virtuous Christian. To be virtuous means to be an impediment 
to the moral decline. Number two, it means to be an influence for good, a positive influence. He says if the salt has lost his savor, okay, savor, savoriness, flavor. Have you ever had that? Have you ever tried food or, or have you ever been on a diet that removes sodium and salt? You know, that kind of food is horrible. It doesn't taste good at all. In fact, when I started my journey of health with my heart issues, the one thing the doctor said, well, well, Josh, you need to watch your sodium intake. And you know what? I never followed that advice because I tried it once and it doesn't taste good. Now, I did try to watch my sugar intake, but that was hard as well. But, but, but salt makes food taste good. Salt and pepper is what they say. So that type of salt is what you put on your food that people consume. Well, if that salt is not refined and it hasn't been processed, then you don't put that salt on food. You put it somewhere else. And where do you put it? Well, in the wintertime, they're going to throw a lot of it on the road. You don't eat that salt. It hasn't been purified. So that's secondary usage for salt. It's not the primary usage. It's secondary. So if you're not a virtuous Christian like you should be, it could be that you're not being used in the best way possible. You'll be secondary usage. And God doesn't want you to be like that. He wants you to be a tasty Christian. He wants you to be a person that's so attractive in your faith that when people look at you, they say, wow, that's what I want. That's what I need. So that's being a virtuous Christian. Number three, a virtuous person's also an instrument of purification. Now, it's not said directly in the passage, but it surely can be implied based off what we know as salt. Okay, and salt heals wounds. Uh, every once in a while, I'll struggle with canker sores, and, and my wife will tell me lovingly, you need to put some salt on that canker sore. And I, I, I hate that because when I do, it burns. It hurts. I hate that feeling. But you know, if I can just endure for the moment, then you know what? Within a day, that salt will have cleaned up that bacteria or whatever that viral infection is, and man, those canker sores are gone. You know why? Because salt is a purifier on wounds. It's, it, it's, it brings healing. You know what? God wants to use you in that same fashion. Because this world, since it's being decayed, since it's being damaged by sin, God wants to use you to put some salt on people's spiritual wounds so that they can have healing. You know what one of the names of God is? Jehovah Rapha. He, the Lord is my healer. Hey, God wants to be Jehovah Rapha to all the world. And it could be that he wants to use you and me to bring people to Jesus Christ, to meet Jehovah Rapha. So you need to be a virtuous Christian, number two. If you're gonna be a channel of God's glory, then number two, you need to be a visible Christian. All right, we've seen a virtuous Christian, and then in the backdrop of being virtuous, the backdrop is a de decaying world, a morally corrupt, fermentating world. But now we're looking at being a visible Christian, which is the metaphor of light. So the backdrop would be darkness. Darkness where there is no light and the truth is not abounding. And God wants to use you to be a visible light lamppost to the world so that they can see the light and come to the light and get saved. So we need to be visible Christians. To be visible uh, means to be uh, being capable of seeing, it means to be well-known, and it means to be accessible. So here, number one, uh, to be a visible Christian means to be identifiable in the darkness. Identity. You know, the world talks about that identity crisis, who I am and what am I. Uh, well, our identity in Jesus is everything. And so people need to know in whom you believe. You need to be shining forth Jesus with your life. That's the light of the world living within you. So you need to be identifiable. So if you, if you, if you are working in a secular workplace or, or some type of environment like that, and then you mention to your relationships in that environment, say, hey, do you want to go to church? Do you want to come to the fall festival tonight? And they say, wow, you go to church? Is that not a problem that they didn't know? Should, should they not already know where you stand as a believer? Hey, being a visible Christian is not somebody that's sitting and hiding in the shadows. 
So you need to be identifiable. That's this first, in verse 14, verse 14 ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid is our second aspect of being visible. And that is this, it's being imminent in the darkness. So identifiable, now imminent. Imminent is I-M-M-I-E-N-T, meaning close at hand. So this is what Jesus is saying in, when he says, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. If you were to visit Israel, the topography is a lot of hills and valleys. Okay, in fact, the Jordan Valley is a place where people would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so they would come uh, to the, a certain road section that people still use today. And then they go up in altitude to Jerusalem. And you cross over a few hills. One would be Bethany and then boom, then you see Jerusalem. And at night, it's gorgeous. It's still the mosque that's there. It's not a temple, but it's still a very beautiful city. You can't miss it because in Bible days and in today, they built those cities on hills. And those would have been natural defense fortresses and whatnot. But the real aspect of what's being applied here is the idea of a city of refuge. Do you remember those in the Old Testament? Cities of refuge were part of the economy of Israel that God set up. And, and, and there were to be three on the west side of the valley and three on the east. And cities of refuge were legal shelter places. So, so if in chance you had accidentally killed your neighbor, maybe through a work accident, so the, the family of the, the slain would come and seek revenge on you. You would flee to a legal shelter called a city of refuge until the process can be played out. When you make it to the city, you are safe. The, 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 the people that want to enact revenge cannot touch you. And so cities of refuge served as types of Jesus Christ because Jesus is a city of refuge. He is a place where you could seek legal shelter because in Jesus, you are safe. And when God the Father looks at you, he sees the just righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to your account when you believe on him. Amen. Hey, he's a city of refuge. And now the Lord Jesus is applying this same principle to you and me, a follower of Jesus. Hey, you too are a city of refuge for people who are in this dark, decaying society, they're looking for truth. Well, my friends, you and I are the light of the world to shine out a city. Somebody can come to you. So when somebody is being hurt by sin and they're looking for answers to where truth is, they come to you because they know you possess the truth. Do you see that? You're a city of refuge. But I'm looking for answers to life. I know who I need to talk to. I'll talk to that church member at Elm Grove Baptist Church. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to go there because they say they preach the truth. Your church is a city of refuge to this dark, decaying world. So if you're going to be a visible Christian, you need to be imminent, close at hand. You need to be identifiable. And then thirdly, you need to illuminate in the darkness. Have you ever tried to walk around in your house at night trying to make your way to maybe the restroom or the kitchen and, and you don't turn the lights on and you think, well, I can make it. I know instinctively where the kitchen is and where the bathroom is. And so you begin like a, like a foolish human being to walk in the dark and you bump your knees on the bedpost. You're stubbing your toes at the door frame, And then you, you, you wake up and you go, oh, or, or, or you finally turn on the light and you go, man, why didn't I do that to begin with? I can see. Yeah, that's why God gave you eyes. You weren't meant to walk in the dark. You were meant to have light shine the pathway and see. Being a visible Christian is what it's all about, friends. I have a friend named um, Nathan Shawless. Nathan, Nathan was unsaved when he came to a Thanksgiving praise service at our church in Simpsonville, Simpsonville South Carolina. And Nathan was struggling with alcohol. 
He had other addictions that were plaguing him. And he came to church. It wasn't a formal service. It was just a praise service. So people would come up to the mic. And we were sitting at tables. We had a you know, Thanksgiving dinner. But then we did this testament time. People would stand up to the microphone. They said, well, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to God because he saved me. And, but if you would have known what my life was like in the past, yeah, you, you'd be thankful that I'm saved as well. And boy, he healed me of this. And he, he's helped me through these problems. My marriage is, is better than it's ever been. Been and boy, I'm just thankful to be saved and experience God's grace person after person after person. Well, Nathan is sitting out in the uh, audience at one of the tables and he's thinking, you know what? I don't know what's going on, but I think I need that. And that night he got saved. And it wasn't because of a, a formal preaching service. No, it was uh, common, ordinary, everyday people saying, God is good to me and he loves me. And I am blessed to be a Christian. And Nathan goes, that's what I want. He, he found some tasty, visible Christians and he got saved. Well, the, the following week, he was out passing out tracks in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. The following year, he went to Bible college. Today, he's a pastor in the state of Illinois. All because of some salty, light-driven Christians shine their light out. Let me close with this. Not only do you need to be a visible, not only do you need to be a virtuous Christian, visible, virtuous, but you also need to be thirdly a vibrant Christian. Not a deadbeat Christian. No one that's pulsating with life, that's kinetic. See in our concluding verse, in verse 16 of Matthew chapter five, it says, let your light so shine. So in other words, you need to take what you've received and all you got to do is let it out. You, you weren't meant to be a fat Christian where you always consume. You were meant to put out. That is a healthy Christian. That's a healthy person. Whatever I intake, I'm going to equally output. And so here he says, you need to let this out so people can see what's going on. A vibrant Christian, number one, releases that light. The word let means to allow it. That's all you got to do is allow what takes place. I, there's a youth pastor uh, that maybe Daniel may, may know, or maybe not, but he said something in our, our, our one of uh, sessions we had at camp, and he said, you know, some people talk about catching the spirit and whatnot. He goes, you know, with my youth department, I just allow the spirit to take place. And I love that. I never forgot that. And that's the same principle. Hey, you have it. Just let it loose. Release the light. Number two, reveal the light. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. The light reveals God. It has nothing to do with you. You are a subpoint of the main point, which it's all about Jesus. Hey, it's not me that's glorious. I have no, nothing to present when it comes to righteousness and talent. I mean, I, I am, I'm a nobody. But in Jesus, I'm complete. I am fully forgiven. I have standing with God because of Jesus. Hey, the light that shines within me, this gospel light is all about Jesus. Number three, we radiate that light through our good works. We radiate it through good works. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. Now, Sunday school class, let me ask you a question. Are you saved by good works? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that was a little tricky question. I apologize for the long pause. That's correct. You are not saved by good works. But class, are you saved unto good works? Yes, that's right. Go to James chapter number two real quick. Let me kind of show you this confusing passage to many people, but, but really there is a lot of clarity to it. But it seems at first, if you were just to read this for the, fir the first time, Pastor James in his letter to some believing Jews, you might be confused because you know our apostle, which is Paul, who spread forth the gospel to these Gentile lands. That's why we here in America have the gospel. It's because the apostle Paul was sent out as a missionary. But Pastor James stayed in Jerusalem. He was a pastor to the Jewish people. So, so, so he seems to contradict our apostle Paul when it comes to good works and salvation. Look at what he says in verse number 14 of chapter 2. What did the prophet, my brother, 
Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, so he opens up his, his dialogue with a, with a question, maybe rhetorical, and as you hear that, you go, hmm, where's he going with this? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, so he's going to explain his, his point, and one of you saying to them, depart in peace and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body, well, what did the prophet? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. This is what James says, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. That devils also believe. You know, I almost feel like he's just taunting here. Well, the devils believe. I mean, who cares? But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified? That's a legal term by works when he had offered Isaac on uh, his son on the altar. And maybe at this point, you're, you're already done. You're, you stopped reading this letter from James. I don't know what he's talking about because I recall in the book of Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's none of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Uh, none of works, lest any man should boast. And, and yeah, everybody ought to be riled up at this moment. So what's he saying? Why would he contradict? Well, here, here's the key. Here's the key. He's not talking about justification before the eyes of God. Because before God, no flesh is justified. You need grace before God. Ah, but before the eyes of this world, of mankind, are you not justified of your faith by your works? In other words, don't you prove it? Don't you prove your faith when you live it out? See, that's the point. In fact, he even clarified. He says, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So he clarified his gospel position. So James is now re-welcomed back to the family of God. He says, you see then how that by works a man is justified where? Before the eyes of men and not by faith only. So in other words, friends, you say you're a Christian, prove it. Prove it. You need to be a virtuous, visible, vibrant Christian. And if you are, the Lord says of his followers, you are manifesting the power and glory of God to this lost world. And when they see that, they ought to go, wow, man, that's what I need. That's what I want. So I got this new heart valve and uh, it does tick. Uh, at summer, uh, during the summer at camp, we were sitting on the porch of one of the buildings, and I was probably standing uh, maybe here in, in proximity to this pulpit where this lady was sitting. And she looks at me while there's kids roaming around the camp. It's loud. She looks at me, she goes, Josh, she goes, do you have a mechanical valve? And I went, you could hear it? She said, well, my father had one, so I, I, I noticed those things. And so I'm a little embarrassed at times when it ticks. Sometimes it ticks at random times. Uh, we were fixing a water heater at the camp in the spring. Uh, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law were, were replacing the elements. They were turning it back on, and they had some wiring issues, uh, but they, they, fi they maneuvered some wires, reconnected things. Then Richard, my father-in-law, goes, hey, oh, it turned on. And I said, no, that's not it. That's me. You know, that, that sounds different, okay? It doesn't sound like this. And they all had a good laugh at that. But, but, you know, this tick, it's loud. It's thumping at night when I lay down. And if I was to put my, my hand, it almost has a reverberating sound. It's very loud. Um, so I still, to this day, can struggle going to sleep with this heart valve. Now, for Jacinda, my wife, it's more like white noise. So it's helped her sleep cycles. It's impeded mine. <laughs> Uh, so you, my kids, they'll, they'll be in the house. They'll be like where Pastor Daniel is back there. They'll go, oh, dad, I hear your heart. And I'm like, ah, oh, get out of here. <laughs> it's loud. It's thumping. It's prominent. But you know, that valve has taught me a lesson because that, that, that sound to my family is pretty precious because when they hear that thump, that click, they go, wow, you know, God, God saved dad. 
You know, he's still around because God took care of him. So that, that sound is precious to my family. But that sound is what you and I ought to be when it comes to faith. You ought to be there where people can't miss it. They ought to be able to pick up off the vibes of your faith. And then it ought to, it ought to conjure a question about what's going on in your life. Because I think I need that. That joy that light is something that needs to be applied to my life. Could you tell me about the gospel of Jesus Christ? And you know what? At that moment, you are shining forth. You're channeling the blessings of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you do. I pray that you would guide and direct us as we worship you in this next service. And thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for saving us. And I pray that all of us would be uh, in the vein of being a channel of blessing, that we would be used of your spirit so that we could see more people come to Christ. And Lord, we want to go ahead and pray in advance for the outreach tonight, that people would come and see a difference, uh, not, not just because we're having a good time, but because the joy is internal. And I pray that people will come to Christ. We love you. We give you all the glory in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen.